Hey, thank you guys for joining us. Wanted to talk today about the challenges of the VC life. A number of VCs are on here today, as well as uh, family offices and other groups that are thinking about going down the VC path and wanted to share with you some uh, information about that. And uh, for those who are VCs, love to hear your, your perspective on some of these. So we'll stop as we go and get some feedback from you guys and your experience as well. So appreciate anything you can share with the rest of the group. Uh, so, you know, the challenge of the VC life is uh, such that, you know, many people want to work for a VC, especially those straight out of college, uh, but many are not aware of what the challenging dynamics that come with a VC life are. And for example, you have to raise funding, you know, just like startups, a VC has to raise funds too. And, you know, limited partners, those who invest in the VC funds tend to be rearview mirror oriented and not focused on the cutting edge of new technologies. And so you have to work with cutting edge startups, but you also have to convince investors that those are worth investing in. Then there's working with partners. You rarely make the decisions alone, but you rather work with other people and you know egos and other agendas are often coming into play at that point. And then you have to get deals done. You have to convince others in your group to that you have a winner there with a deal you want to invest in, and you have to sell it all the way through the process. And then you have to manage the deal flow. An untold number of startups will apply and only a small fraction even meet your criteria. And you have to manage that deal flow process on a regular basis. And then there's dealing with co-investors. It's rare that one investor invests all the funds necessary to make a startup successful. So you have to work with other investors as syndicate partners and as follow-ons and other things. And so, uh, is, is, you know, the startup life is a roller coaster. You know, there's ups and there's downs. And, and the VC is in that, uh, on that roller coaster with the startup, you know, filling the highs and undergoing the lows as well. And so there, there are challenges that just come with that that uh, we, we have to deal with. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, one thing is VCs have to raise funding just like startups do. Uh, you know, they raise from limited partners. These could be family offices, institutions, pension funds, and other sources. And you know, institutional investors, they, they require a fairly substantial investor track record. You have to have been in a group before and have actually made investments and can demonstrate that uh, you can be successful at this. And, and for many, many of the groups that are starting micro VC funds, sub $100 million funds, uh, the VC fund may be too small for some institutional investors. And you know, they can't have their funds be more than 20% of the total uh, fund itself. And so uh, you have to look for family offices and others that want to invest in uh, a micro VC fund that are not institutional. And so you end up having to deal with a, a lot of people along the way. But when you go to them, you need to have develop your investment uh, thesis and you've got your perspectives put together and you talk about well, how you're unique. It's important to be unique. If you're just the same fund as everyone else, it can be hard to raise funding. I've shopped deals where they wanted recurring revenue and it was just any deal would work and it wasn't very unique. And, um, and LPs found that difficult to get behind because it was uh, too much uh, me too. Uh, and they want something unique and uh, stands out from the crowd. And the, you have to make clear what the fees the partners will pay up front along the way, et cetera, and then how the profits will be distributed. And then finally, uh, you have to go out and pitch the limited partners, just like startups are pitching the VC. You have to pitch institutional investors and others that will invest in the deal. And they, they want to see a clear, cogent argument for investing in your fund versus the other five funds that are next door. And so on the next slide, you know, the VCs make money through management fees. VCs charge limited partners a management fee on the fund. Their salary is basically baked into that fund up front. And it's typically 2%. And we'll talk about changes here in a minute. But it's paid out every year for the life of the fund. And some funds start the management fee around year six or seven as proceeds from the investment starts to come in. Come in, come in. And micro, and micro VCs often charge 2.5 or 3% of the funds raised. Again, these are sub $100 million funds. And so you can actually charge more than 2% if you have a, a much lower fund itself, but then you have to justify that. You have to make clear why you're doing that. You know, we're hiring extra people. We're going to be doing extra things. And so we'll get an additional return that comes out of it. And the second source of, um, of compensation is carry. Uh, and it's a basically a, per, per, a percent of any proceeds that are coming back to the investor from the investments itself. And it's typically around 20%. 
And what's important is to make clear is to when does the carry, when do, does the investors start to take the carry from the investment returns? Is it uh, when the carry, the returns come in or after the limited partners uh, receive their initial investment back? You know, years ago, it was whenever uh, the funds started coming in. But today, the standard is, you know, the investor must get their funds back first. And then, then we start to take carry at that point. And so you have to make clear to the investors which way this actually is going down. And so there are other ways that VCs can make more money. And in, in rough numbers, the VC takes the amount to be raised and they double it for a pre-money valuation. And the VC receives equity ownership of the investment divided by post-money valuation. So, so to go through the math on this, say you're raising $1 million, the VC will turn that into a $2 million pre-money and then add the $1 million to reach a $3 million post-money valuation. And it's the ownership is the investment divided by post money, which is one divided by three in this case is a third of the equity. And that's how much equity the startup needs to give to the VC for the funding itself. And so VCs have limited bandwidth and you can only take on a certain number of deals. And so they're looking for the deals that will agree to those kind of metrics. And the better the deals they are, the, the more they can charge their limited partners. But fundamentally, the VCs have a, a lot of choices. And for them to choose you, you have to really choose you as a startup. You have to be fairly competitive on the uh, pre-money valuations that come into it. Uh, I've had people come in and they're, they're worth $20 million and they have 100K of revenue. It's going to be very hard for VCs to get behind and you're not going to have as much negotiation leverage as a startup as you think you are. And as a VC, you have to think of that. You, you know, some of the better deals are going to not want to give up so much. And so you have to walk that line between what makes your fund work and what good deals you can bring to the, the limited partners. Uh, the next one is to look at the time element of returns. I, I think most VCs do this, but a lot of new people coming in, especially angel investors don't, is you often hear people talk in terms of return on investment. Uh, what's my ROI on this deal? And that, that's metric basically that says, this is one yeah, I got back without respect to time. The number we should be looking at is IRR or in internal rate of return and it's return on investment, but with respect to time. So the faster you get your money back, the higher your IRR is. Whereas with ROI, it doesn't matter when you get your money back. So if I invest 50K and receive 150K back in three years, my ROI is 3X. If I receive it back in five years, the ROI is still 3X. But for IRR, if that in that same example, if I invest 50K and receive 150K back in three years, my IRR is 44%. If I receive it back in five years, my, IR, my ROI, my IRR drops down to 25%. And it basically shows that there's a, a time value to money that has to be taken into account. And so that's why most VCs quote uh, returns in IRR. And as uh, those who want to go into it need to start thinking along those lines. And it's easy um, math example you can do in Excel. Uh, you put in a column, you put in your initial investment, and then at what year you get back returns, and it calculates the IRR for you itself. And angels and VCs look for investments that are in the 20 to 30% IRR range, typically is the floor of what they'll, they'll accept. So the next concept is funds held in reserve. When you invest in a deal, you always, always need to set money aside for follow-on deals as well. And so when a venture capitalist makes an investment, there's typically a follow-on round they want to participate in eight, six, 12, 18, 24 months down the road. And you need to set aside some amount of money for that investment in order to maintain your position in there and also to help the startup who will as you know, is if they've got the pedal to the metal and they're really pushing it all the way, they're going to need more fuel along the way and you need to be in a place that you can help them at some level with it. And you know, this money that they have set aside is for those companies. If I invest and then I have some money set aside for the follow-on, what remains in my fund is what's called dry powder. This is one thing startups should always check with a venture capitalist is how much dry powder do they have left? The last thing the startup wants to hear is the VC says, hey, that's great. When we raise the next fund, we'll, you'll be the first one we call. You really want to know how much dry powder they have left in this fund before everything is spoken for by current and, current and other portfolio companies itself. So it's important to know 
how much you're reserving per deal as well. And next is on syndicates and syndication, both angels and VCs, you know, they have to work with other groups out there. And so you have to build connections with other investors to syndicate deals and to partner on these deals. And sometimes these syndicates are very formal. You have signed agreements, you're in the same group. Uh, other times they're very informal. We just have a gentleman's agreement. If I invest in something, you'll look at it. You invest in something, I'll look at it as well. And maybe we, we invest. And then sometimes they'll, they'll actually say, well, if you invest, if I invest in your deal, you're agreeing to invest in one of my deals in the future. And so there's some cross syndication that comes into it so that uh, you can uh, make sure that you get additional funding for your startups. And typically there's no compensation for this. It's simply agreements to share deals and uh, fund each other's deals in order to make both sides successful. And so you're always looking for VCs and other groups that are investing in the kind of deals you wanna invest in and you wanna work with them on the deal. Cause when you co-invest with somebody, both, both groups are coming together to help the company during the tough times and, and also helping them make decisions. So you wanna have an aligned vision about where this is going in the future itself. And the next one is, last slide is the fiduciaries. Um, venture capitalist brings a fiduciary responsibility to those raising funds from limited partners. So that means the VC has to act in the best interest of the investors. So VCs who sit on the board of their portfolio companies, you know, they also have a fiduciary responsibility. And there, there are times when those fiduciaries come into conflict. For example, it's best to have your duties to the investor stated in the PPM, such as liquidation preferences and preferred shareholder treatment. So you know that you're going to be doing that. But the VC must also appear to be following a fair treatment of both, the, both parties and may need to engage in negotiations to resolve the conflict. VCs often use incentives such as offering additional equity to either the startup or the fund's investors to resolve those conflicts. Because there comes a time when you have to decide, are we gonna put more money in to grow bigger? Or are we gonna just start to move to an exit to take our money now? And you find that uh, people are on both sides of that equation. And as a VC, you have to help uh, navigate through that, uh, in making both sides that somewhat you know, amenable to the solution that you come up with. So you have to think about how you can negotiate when you have conflicting uh, perspectives inside the group. But we have some VCs here with us today. I'd love to hear you guys, your guys' thoughts on the challenges of the VC life. Uh, Chris, you, you joined us. Did you have any particular thoughts there that you'd like to share with the group? I guess one of the things that I find from a VC perspective um, from startups or early stage companies approaching us uh, for funds is basically the lack of research that they've done on what I'm interested in. Because like I'll get, I, I get tons of deal flow all the time, but yet they don't fit our investment criteria such as sector or or scale or, or, or the, the stage of the deal kind of thing. So just doing at least going out to the website and looking at, at what, they're, what they're looking for or going to Crunchbase or, or something like that to see what they've invested in. Or if say for instance, you're a, a consumer manufacturing company or a consumer products company, look for people that have actually invested in your area versus just taking a shotgun approach to everybody. Good point, good point, thanks. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Joe, did you have any comments there to join us? Chris, I have a question for you. How do you typically handle those um, deal flow inquiries when they don't meet your criteria? Do you answer the emails or do you not even have the time to, to get all to all those. Honestly, I hate to say it, but I really don't have all the time to answer every single one of them. Yeah. Um, if they look good, I mean, if if I can see that the the pitch was developed, and you're uh, and you're really on top of your game, and you really have some some I guess some uh, wind behind your sails, I might answer it back and say, hey, not a fit for us, but since it's healthcare, we don't deal with healthcare at all, but go to the guys in Boston because that's where healthcare is really centralized. Or if it's energy or something like that, I'll go, hey, not for us, but you might want to check out uh, some people in, in Houston 
because 1839 Ventures, we always took the culture of no, but here's the resource for you. Mm. But sometimes it's like you get one and it's just like, I have no faith and confidence in you at all anyway, so I'm not going to answer you back. But then what really kind of irks me here recently is that I'll get three or four emails from the same person saying, hey, I emailed you on Tuesday. I emailed you on, on Thursday. These are only two days apart. It's kind of like, guys, I don't check that every single day and, and things. So it's kind of like make sure I, – I guess what I'm trying to get at is – Make sure you've done a little bit of research. And some of the family offices uh, that I've spoke to is they want to know they want to be asked what do they like to invest in first before they they ever get approached. It's like, hey, invest in my funds. It's like, well, we're not interested in early stage VC funds. Do some research beforehand. That's the biggest thing that I can do. Take 30 seconds, go out to the website look at the website and say, okay, these guys are actually interested in, in my fund or phrase the, the email to us that says, hey, I've got this deal. It's in this space. Would you be interested in looking at it? But alternatively, attach the pitch deck to it because you're only going to get one shot at a conversation. Yeah. It's be a yes or no. So yeah, go ahead. that makes sense. Is there anyone here today that is not part of a VC, but is interested in learning how to get involved with a VC, someone that's learning? No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I know, Hall, you, you, you had asked me a question. I was struggling to get off mute, um, but, but Chris chimed in, and I think that uh, I, I echo everything that Chris said. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge I have, and, and we invest across a couple of different stages, but kind of under different brands. And, and the biggest challenge for us is people not doing that diligence. I mean, we, we blatantly say on our website, you either need, if it's Natureza, you need a $5 million minimum annual run rate. Um, or if it's Tech Ventures, we don't invest in pre-revenue, you know, ideas basically that haven't been validated even if it's a couple hundred thousand dollars of revenue hasn't been validated by the market so i i completely agree that sometimes when i find companies that reach out anyways there's obviously great opportunities to to start a dialogue with a company and and learn a little bit about them so that when they do grow up and they meet your criteria potentially you you have a relationship and, and you might have a position, be in a position to lead the round or whatever the case may be. But um, I, I find in Chris, you made a point about people reaching out to you multiple, multiple times. I mean, sometimes it just ends up coming across as needy. And, and those are the type of opportunities that we become less attracted to because um, it, it shows, I mean, every company needs money. We all know that. That's why you reached out to us. But if, if you, if you're in a needy, need-based situation, we probably don't want to get involved in that either because it's not going to be right for some other reason within our investment criteria. So I think, um, I, I feel like the, for us, we focus on consumer and there's such a fragmentation in the marketplace in, in terms of number of new consumer startups and everyone needs capital and, and we get that, but um, doing a little bit more homework and figuring out who the right audience is to, to talk to folks is is probably best. And I think it's, it's becoming harder and harder for uh, venture capital stage businesses to raise capital um, because of the, the level of competition that's out there. And, and the, I think the criteria is getting tougher um, as it relates to the actual VCs themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. Um, would love to get an entrepreneur's perspective here, Matt. Uh, given if you want to um, introduce yourself and maybe give the other side of the challenges of VC life, what what have been some challenges that you've had trying to reach out to VCs and, and getting that attention? Um, yeah, well, thanks for, for the uh, thanks for the intro there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Matt, and I've um, I'm currently the chair of a company called Intellivideo. Um, we've been in and out of the raising money. Um, <clears throat> cycle a couple of different times. We're currently doing a note and we're looking to do a series A. Um, uh, 
I, and I've, I've raised money before with, with other ventures as well. Um, so I guess I've, um, had a lot of conversations with VCs, I guess. Um, and, um, you know, one of the, I would say one of the hardest things as an entrepreneur is, um, uh, well, I would have a specific question for the, for the, for the guys on the guys and girls, the VCs on the call. Um, maybe I'll use as a part two, but as the, I think the hardest part for the uh, entrepreneur is probably discerning seriousness versus just like, we'll wait and see. Cause I've had a lot of conversations obviously with VCs and it's, and, and they say, well, circle back when you're here or when you're there. And, um, you know, I guess my radar has gotten a little better to, to understand when that, when that mean, when that means no versus not yet versus we're really interested and, um, you know, would, uh, um, would certainly love to have a follow-up conversation when you hit this milestone or that milestone. So, um, you, you know, I guess maybe the little, uh, uh, hope, hope you find this humorous, but the, um, the little humorous jokes some entrepreneurs have when talking to VCs is like, uh, they'll never tell you yes and they'll never tell you no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, um, so uh, I don't know, maybe some guidance from you guys about, you know, what, like, what, what are the, the signs an entrepreneur should look at that you are serious in a, in a legitimate follow-up versus maybe a, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just keep you in the Rolodex in case you're the next Peloton or something like that. <clears throat> yeah, I'm having to chime in quick here. I think it's uh, usually doing a level of diligence and asking to meet other members of the team, asking for information, all of that stuff. I, I feel like we're always looking to meet new folks and, and kind of what I mentioned before, uh, maybe position ourselves for a future round or something like that. So I think when you start to get the more detailed questions asked, you start to walk through the model, all different, that kind of next level of detail getting into the weeds is really, I think, when you can start to uh, gather some seriousness from investors. Um, and I think if the questions that they're posing are, are a little bit challenging in terms of, hey, have you guys thought about this? Or how do you view this? Or how are you going to attack the market? What's going to be your next leg higher of growth? Can you actually achieve that? Like those types of very pointed questions, I think, are, are where investors show seriousness as opposed to um, keeping that conversation relatively high level introductory and, and so on. And so that to me is kind of a bit of a telltale sign. And um, frankly, where we try to keep it. I, I take a lot of introductory calls with a lot of companies. And I think it's more of, it, it never hurts to expand your network, meet folks and, and position yourselves for a future round. But um, it, it's when you kind of start to get asked the questions for all that additional info, I think that people are, are starting to take it a little bit more seriously and would consider a potential investment. And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be scared to, to ask somebody, um, directly and say, Hey, what, what is your appetite for this? I mean, if, if you fit the criteria of theirs from what you can tell, um, say, Hey, is this something that you guys are looking for to add to your portfolio? Or if you, and it depends a lot too on the VC, but if it's a, I'm using consumer cause that's what we do. If you're a beverage company and we already have seven beverage investments and we have three food investments and three consumer, um, services investments or household products investments, we're probably pretty full on beverage and looking to round out those other categories. Um, so it, it depends a little bit too on that criteria aspect, but that's a, a couple points that I think about. Well, thank you, Joe. I, I would tend to agree with that too. Um, I like to speak an analogy sometimes because it's easy to visualize, but ex exactly what uh, Joe was just saying was that gauge the number of questions but like like joe was saying at the end i'll start at, at the end and then move back towards what he began with um do a trial close just ask hey is this something that you guys would be interested in that way you kind of get a yes or no right off the bat because some people in this industry i've noticed that they don't like to tell you no but it's because they some have a fear of missing out so they don't want to tell you no, just in case if you're the next best thing, because then they can't get in on it later because they, they want to join the crowd kind of thing. So, but, but I was given a, a very good uh, analogy by one of my mentors and friends, I guess, that think about a bowling, bowling alley and think about the 10 pins that are set up. 
your pitch deck is generally a, the first pin in that bowling alley and, and the very first pin that that ball is going to hit. So when you send me that pitch deck and I then hit that hit that first pin with the, the ball kind of thing and gain some interest, you already have nine pins behind you. But when I start knocking into what Joe is saying about when, when I say, okay, have you guys thought of this in your business uh, or the business strategy or what's the go-to-market strategy? Okay, that's pin number two. Oh, have you ever thought about uh, to, to get into this market alongside of that? Or like in televideo, I'm just going to make up something because I don't really know, know anything about your, the, the, the market here. Was Let's say in televideo is exactly like Zoom. And you're like, okay, so you're, you're cheaper than Zoom. You're, more, you're better than Zoom, blah, blah, blah. This is great. That's fantastic. But as soon as I start asking about, have you thought of this? Have you thought about bringing educational videos to people? Have you started thinking about that? Those are some of the tell, telltale signs that I might be interested in it. Otherwise, it's I would take it more of a no of saying, well, I, I see that you have 50,000 monthly users right now, but call me back when you get to 150,000. And then all of a sudden, two weeks later, you have 150,000 and you call me back and you say, hey, we're 250,000. And then I give you that next step up saying, well, tell me when, call me back when you have this. I, I wouldn't say that's an interested investor. I would do like Joe says is saying, okay, here's my pitch deck. Here's the business model. We've had our first call. Is this something that you're interested in? Because like Joe is saying, he might have two foods, but nine beverages and you're just another beverage. And he's looking He's saying, hey, I've got too many of those. So those, those are some of the things that you might consider. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Tyler had an interesting question. Uh, Tyler Felt here asked for VC firm formation, uh, thoughts on Delaware for an entity, still wise to do or just charter in state of operation? Chris or Joe, do you have an opinion here? S sorry, that's as the company or that's as a, as a fund? Yeah, that, my question. Thanks uh, for for taking it. Uh, for the for the the various entities that would make up a, a VC firm, you know. So you're talking not only the uh, the LLCs, assuming uh, uh, as well as you know management companies that would would run the funds. Yeah, I mean, I we we've almost always just done Delaware LLCs. Um, the management companies, I think, are a bit up to you. And I think it's, it's depending on how you're structuring it to some extent as well, right. In terms of taxes and so on and so forth. So I, I think it's a little bit of a case by case situation. Uh, we we've stuck to doing as much as we can in, in Delaware. Um, the management companies are, are usually, you're going to need some type of other location. Anyways, just as you think about filing taxes, you're going to have a, a different location um, unless you do have a way to do it all in Delaware. Um, and that's not to say you can't use one of the, the service providers that do that. Um, I think all I'm saying is, is you just have to think about how it's, the structure works best for you. Uh, I mean, Florida is another great place that you can obviously limit your taxes and that sort of thing. So I think it's very much a case by case scenario, but in every instance that we can, we have everything set up through Del you know, very basic Delaware LLCs, um, inclusive of our management company. Our management company is technically a Delaware LLC. Um, so there's, there's different ways to kind of uh, structure it, but I think you probably got to work more with an accountant, tax advisor, fund administrator, to figure out what's going to be best for your situation. So, um, I, I'm sorry, guys. I got to actually hop to a to a two thirty Eastern call here, but it was good to connect with everyone and, and look forward to doing it again at some point here. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much, Glad Joe. you could join us. Yeah. Um, and as Joe pointed out, we are at our thirty minute mark. Um, just wanted to see if anybody had any um, additional questions or comments before we wrap this one up. All right. Thanks, Ashley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, Interesting. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, I will send over the recording if you want to review the information. Um, I'll include Hall's Calendly link if anyone has any further questions. And we appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you.